while paid October. For the troop days in August, they had been trucked back to the Arno River. Soon after, however, the 442, along with the 100 battalion, was transported to the port of Piombino. They were conveyed by ship to Naples. There, they boarded another ship and sailed to Marseille in the south of France. You can never understand the thinking of the generals who moved the troops around, but he didn't from reading Stars and Straits, the Army newspaper, that shortly after D-Day, the Allies had landed in Normandy on the west coast of France. The second front had been opened in southern France. Those who had landed in the west had now taken Paris and were pushing on across France. The southern attack had driven the Germans northward. The Allies forces emerged in Germany. The fight had become intense, and Yuki assumed that the 432nd had been brought into the help of national German defense. What most of Yuki's friends believed was that military leaders now considered their unit one of the best, able to break through it when others couldn't. And it was not just the 100th Italian that was considered elite, but higher 442. Yuki knew that the south coast of France was a place to vacation, but he guessed correctly that he would not be there long. What he hadn't expected was almost constant rain. Even worse, as trucks carried the men northward, the rain and cold continued. The long hours in the back of a jolting, jostling truck were tedious. But by October 11th, men set up camp near the Vosage Fort in France, not far from the Rhine River, which formed the border with Germany. The terrain in this part of France was different from the land the 442nd had occupied in Italy. The forests were filled with spreading French oaks and long needled pines and some 70 feet high. The dense growth created a full canopy overhead. The men camped one night under these dark trees. They dug foxholes and then covered them with shelter halves, small tents, two halves of which snapped together at the top, but there was no staying dry. The rain dribbled through the tree's canopy and water ran everywhere, working its way into the foxholes and turning the ground in and out of holes to heavy mud. They were still wearing summer uniforms, the army not having supplied them yet with winter coats and boots, so they suffered just getting through the night. The 442nd had been away from battle for over a month, but what Lieutenant Freeman now announced was that 2nd Battalion would make a thrust toward Bruyers in the morning. He told the men that Bruyers was a crossroad town with several roads and a railroad line all converging there, and it was held by the Germans. It was a key town that needed to be cleared before pushing on to Rhine. We can't just charge into Bruyers, the lieutenant told the men, we have to take the high ground on the hills around this. Our battalion... Along with 3rd Battalion, have to push the enemy off Hill B on the north side of town. Fox Company soldiers had managed to scrounge more firepower. Some of them had Browning automatic rifles and others had Thompson submachine guns. By now, the troops also knew how to work together, how to cover for one another, how to lay down a fierce field of fire that could overwhelm the enemy. After Lieutenant Freeman explained the strategy of the attack, Sergeant Kolba had some things to add. The battalion officers are telling us this is going to be a cakewalk, but I think the Germans are lying low. When we attack, if we don't need much resistance, don't get overconfident. Brewer's is too important for the Germans to give up easy. I think these hills are full of krauts. But at 0800 that morning, everything began the way the battalion leaders had predicted. The march started in the dark forest and all was quiet. The rain had stopped, but the trees continued to drip keeping the men's uniforms soaked. The men advanced toward Hill B and then began a gradual ascent. Yuki hoped there would be no resistance at all. But just when he had begun to relax, everything changed suddenly and violently. A line of German soldiers sprang up out of the ground. They cast off limbs and greenery that they had used to cover their slit trench and they opened fire. Machine pistols started first and in only a few seconds, machine gunners began to fill the forest with their racket the bullets striking trees ripping through the underbrush. The naysay troops dropped down, found cover behind trees, but Sergeant Kobo was shouting, Don't fall back! Go after them! Yuki didn't charge directly into the fire, but he followed Sergeant Oshira's example. He broke to the cover of a nearby tree, fired his rifle in a quick burst, hit until he'd stopped during fire, and then made another quick run for forward. Yuki's fire team followed and used the same method of advanced. By then, the enemy fire was not... 
Just from the line of soldiers in the slit trench, German mortars and heavy artillery had begun to pound the forest. Yuki hunkered down as shells hit high in the trees and sent shrapnel and broken tree limbs like spears crashing around him. Sergeant Koba was shouting again, Don't stop! Keep going! And Yuki understood. To stop was to wait for the artillery to fill the forest with flying steel. He rushed ahead, took aim, and fired at a machine gun. Then he dropped again, waited a few seconds, and made another quick dash. He spotted Shig, Higa, and Tana all working their way closer to the Germans like he was, and young Private Sato was staying with Shig, making the same moves. Yuki was about to break forward again when he heard something new. A German landmine, a bouncing Betty, clinked as it released. Yuki glanced over just as the mine jumped a few feet into the air and died. The explosion tore into a man's groin and torso. The soldier, one of the replacements, folded in on himself, slumped to the ground, and then let out a deep groan. Yuki knew that medics would move in as soon as they could to help the guy. For now, the platoon had to keep driving ahead, but every step was dangerous. Yuki had no idea how many landmines might be out there in the woods. Somewhere in the midst of all the noise and smoke, he heard another clank. Another mine explode. At the same time, shells were still dropping into the trees. It was like walking through hell with fire from the earth and sky, the noise deafening, the smoke and flying debris blurring everything. But the Nisei soldiers were also taking a toll on the line of defense in front of them. From the cover of the trees, the Americans were firing their rifles and automatic weapons, and many of the Germans had gone down. The intense return fire was gradually diminishing, and then suddenly the defensive line broke. The Germans began leaping from their trench and running into the forest, some of them dropping as the Americans continued to fire at them. The AJA soldiers ran to the trench, and Sergeant Koba yelled for his platoon to hold up. Yuki jumped into the trench, then looked around to watch for his men. All of the soldiers in his fire team were all right, and Yuki spotted Matt, but he thought that five or six from the platoon had gone down, maybe more. He could see a number of soldiers on the ground under trees, and medics were moving up to help them. Yuki worked his way through the trench, past some other men, and over to Shig. Are you okay, he asked. Shig nodded. I'm thinking they might send us forward again once we rest a little. Yuki knew that, but the two sat down in the trench, leaned back, and let themselves catch their breath. After a few minutes, Shig said, We lost Kikuchi from Matt's squad. Trapnel ripped up his face and neck really bad. Yuki didn't say anything. Shig knew the man better than Yuki did. He was one of the smartest guys I've ever... Is he dead? Yeah, I'm sure he is. Then there's no use talking about him. I just... I know. But don't tell me anything else. I don't want to know. Yuki realized that he sounded angry, and he didn't want to talk to Shig that way. He softened his voice and said, I just don't want to have him on my mind. You understand what I'm saying, don't you? Sure. But Yuki knew the truth. He would be thinking about these guys the rest of his life, even the ones he hadn't known too well. After a time, Sergeant Koba spread the word that the platoon would stop where it was for the rest of the day. Yuki thought that was a bad decision. He was relieved not to push ahead, but it seemed to him that they should keep the Germans on the run. The men rested, ate, waited. The rain had started again, and the trench soon began collecting water. Yuki and Shig, like most of the men, sat on their helmets to stay out of the mud, and after a time, they all began gathering the brush the Germans had used to cover the trench. They even cut down saplings to stif stiffen the roof they were creating. Most of the men had shelter halves with them, and they wrapped up those and tried. As Dirk settled in to stay dry and warm, but the cold was miserable, and Yuki's feet were freezing. He knew his socks were wet. The medics always told the men they had to change stockings every day and put the wet ones inside their uniforms under their arms where the wool could dry. But it wasn't easy to change socks in a muddy hole or to dry them inside a wet uniform. Yuki sensed that trench foot, the decaying of tissue caused by dampness and cold, would now be as en much an enemy as German bullets. He knew he needed to change his stockings soon, but he didn't want to unwrap himself in the cold. He vowed to do it in the morning. As it turned out, the battle for him continued for three days, and every inch of ground had to be taken the same way, the men attacking through the forest in short bursts against withering fire. More men in the platoon and company were going down each day, but Yuki was relieved that his own fire team was still untouched. Then, on October 18th, the battle battalion pushed the German troops out of their position at the top of the hill, and on the same day, other American forces took the town of Bruyers. 
Yuki was hurting by the time the troops settled in on the high ground. He had finally changed his socks, but the rain had continued off and on, all through the battles, and he never really got his spare stockings dry. His feet had begun to sting and ache, so he knew that he could be in trouble before long. Still, there was no chance to do much about it. After two nights of rest in the cold and wet, the battalion was ordered to move deeper into the Vo Vosage Forest and take another hill, this one called Hill, hill D. What the naysay faced this time was the same challenge as before, an entrenched enemy occupying higher ground and a dense forest to penetrate. As they began to advance through the trees, they were pinned down by fire from the top of the hill, but they didn't turn back. They slowly worked their way through the forest toward the crest of the hill until they reached the edge of a clearing. Faced with machine gun emplacements on the high side of the clearing, they stopped. Minutes passed, and Yuki saw the difficulty. German tanks and artillery could zero in and shell them. Mortars were likely to start hitting them at any moment. He knew the platoon had to either drop back quickly or make a hard drive forward. Someone had to decide. It was Sergeant Koba who suddenly charged into the clearing, carrying a Thompson submachine gun. He concentrated his fire on one of the emplacements at the top of the clearing. The German gun fell silent, and Yuki was about to charge forward with his fire team. But in an instant, Koba was struck by German fire, and he tumbled backward down the hill. Yuki saw him fall and was about to run to him, but men who were closer were already going after him. Two of those men were hit immediately, and the others fell back. No one moved. The men of 2nd Platoon had seen their platoon sergeant go down, and they had seen some of their brothers riddled with bullets while they were trying to help him. Yuki and Shig were lying flat behind a big pine tree. We can't just stay here, Shig said. Yuki knew that, but someone had moved into the clearing with a white flag and four men with red crosses on their helmets. Medits carried. Leader ran toward the sergeant and the other wounded men. One pair worked on Sergeant Koba for only a few seconds and then shifted him onto a leader, while the other men looked after the other two men who had gone down. As the medics lifted Sergeant Koba and began to carry him away, a sniper bullet buzzed through the air. Yuki saw Sergeant Koba hunch, shot through the body while lying on the ground. No more rifles were firing, and one of the medics dropped to the ground. Yuki felt a crazy rage fill his head. The Germans couldn't do that. They couldn't shoot medics, couldn't shoot wounded men on litters. He knew he had to kill someone. He jumped up, and just as he saw Sergeant Oshira charging into the clearing. He had a Browning automatic rifle slung under his arm, and he was firing an automatic, spreading bullets at the entrenched forces up above, and that was all the men the platoon needed to see. As though by signal, they charged out of their cover and broke into the clearing, all of them shooting, the noise constant and thundering. Yuki ran forward, firing his rifle, only one thing in mind. He would make it to the top of the hill, and he would kill all the Germans he could. Banzai! Someone shouted, and everyone picked up the old Japanese cry. Yuki bellowed the word and kept running. He felt like a samurai warrior. Nothing was going to stop him. The charge up the hill was more chaos than precision. The air seemed full of bullets slapping into the ground around Yuki or flying past him, but he didn't care. The roar from both sides was incessant, and even though men were falling, no one took cover. Every man who still had legs under him kept going, and the enemy fire slowed, then stopped. Yuki could see German soldiers running from foxholes and machine gun nests and running farther up the hill into the dense trees. It was all over in a few minutes, and suddenly everything was quiet. But Yuki wanted more. He kept running, looking for someone to shoot. He finally saw a German cowering near a tree, an easy, an easy target. Yuki aimed carefully and squeezed the trigger, or at least he tried. But he couldn't do it. He dropped the rifle down, thought for a moment, then told himself he had to do it for Sergeant Koba. He aimed again, actually strained to tighten his finger on that trigger, and failed again. The German's helmet was gone, and blood was running from his head down his neck. His face was distorted, his eyes full of confusion and despair. Yuki's anger was seeping away. He still wanted to shoot someone, but he knew he couldn't kill this man. The German finally slumped to the ground, maybe dead. Yuki didn't know what to feel about that. He wanted to run after the retreating Germans, somehow find the one who had shot Sergeant Koba, and then have his revenge. But he was still watching the wounded soldier. He started to walk toward him. He knew he couldn't just leave him there to die. When he got to the man, he turned him over and saw that a bullet had pierced his head just above his ear and had broken away a hunk of his skull. Shig walked up close. He's dead. 
he said. I hope he was the one who shot Sergeant Koba. I don't think it was this guy, Yuki told him, but he didn't know why he felt that way. The two of them kept staring at the man, the gruesome damage to his head. A few months back, such a sight would have made Yuki sick, but he had seen plenty since then, and the wound itself meant nothing to him. What he was remembering was the desperate look he had seen on the man's face. It was what had stopped him from shooting. I don't understand the Krauts, Shig said. Who could shoot a man in a litter? But Yuki knew something that Shig didn't. Yuki had come within a breath of pulling his own trigger. He could have killed a man who was down and wounded, just hoping to survive. Most of them wouldn't do that, he said, but war does things to people. They get crazy. Shoot medics? I could never do that. I know, you couldn't. You're bleeding, Yuki. I know. Somewhere on the hill, he had felt the sharp sting of a bullet as it sliced his arm above the elbow. Walk back to where I left my pack. Let me look at it. So the two walked to the place where the Germans had been dug in. Naysay soldiers were all around now. Some were still letting out their anger, swearing, cursing the Germans. Others were sitting, breathing, utterly exhausted. And some were on their way back down the hill to help the wounded. Shig helped Yuki take his jacket off, and then they looked at the wound. It was bleeding, but it wasn't deep. A slice maybe two inches long. In the past, Yuki would have thought how close he had come, how easily he could have been killed. But he wasn't thinking about that now. He was thinking of the new reality for the platoon. Sergeant Koba was gone. You need to go down and get this bandage, Shig said. Mm, just do it yourself. It's not serious. You could get an infection if it's not cleaned up right. Just slap something on there. It's okay. You'll get a purple heart. No, I won't take a medal for a cut on my arm. The sergeant is the one who deserves all the medals. 